Well, Michael talked about the transportation bill. Of course, we've got two bills. We have a, a Senate bill that's passed the Senate. We have a House bill that uh, passed the House Transportation Committee but did not make it to the floor of the House. And they take quite different approaches. But it struck me that neither of them address one of the fundamental problems in transportation finance, and that is that we've been relying on gas taxes to fund most of our transportation for a long time, and it's never been a perfect user fee. My home state of Oregon was the first state to pass a gas tax in, in 1919 and dedicate it as a user fee to highways, and by 1931, every other state had done the same. In 1956, Congress did the same when it created the interstate highway system. But it's never been a perfect user fee, and it's becoming more and more imperfect all the time. Uh, one reason it's becoming imperfect is because cars have gotten a lot more fuel efficient, uh, about 40% more fuel efficient than they were 40 years ago. And that fuel efficiency means that when you buy gasoline, you're not paying as much uh, to use the roads as you used to pay. Counting fuel efficiency and inflation together, uh, when you uh, buy gasoline today, you're only paying one-third as much for every mile you drive as Americans paid in 1956, the year the interstate highway system was created. Uh, and that's not enough to keep the system going. Highways cost a lot to maintain as well as to build, and uh, there just isn't enough to go around. That's only going to get worse. The Congressional Budget Office says that under the new CAFE standards that the Obama administration has created, uh, the highway revenues are going to be uh, declining because highway f or, or car fuel efficiencies are going to be growing faster than the rate of driving. And that means even if, even if the, we recover the, from the recession, people start driving more, uh, we're going to have a loss in revenue. So uh, gas taxes aren't cutting it. And then we got into the third problem, which is that uh, Cars, some cars aren't are even going to be using gasoline anymore or other kinds of uh, fuel. They're going to be electrically powered, and we don't have a way of charging for that. And so they're going to essentially get to use the highways for free. Um, so one solution is to raise gas taxes. But it turns out the reason why the gas tax is an imperfect fee, or some of the reasons why it's an imperfect fee, won't be solved simply by raising gas taxes. Another problem. Uh, was raised when the I-35W bridge in Minneapolis collapsed a few years ago, and people started talking about an infrastructure crisis. They said it's going to cost a lot of money to rebuild the interstate highway system, to replace bridges and so on, and uh, the gas taxes were not covering the, those funds. Now, the truth is that highways really are not suffering an infrastructure crisis. The, it turns out that the bridge in, in Minneapolis that collapsed, collapsed not because of a maintenance failure, but because of a design flaw that could not have been detected during ordinary maintenance. So there was nothing that maintenance could have done to have fixed that. And it turns out that the number of bridges that are considered structurally deficient, that is, uh, in need of either serious maintenance or should be replaced, has been steadily declining since at least 1990, which is the earliest year for which I could find data. Uh, the number has fallen by more than 50 percent in that time. and uh, that, has, uh, that means we really don't have as much of an infrastructure crisis as people sometimes claim. However, the bridges that remain tend to be locally owned bridges, owned by cities and counties rather than by states or the federal government. Uh, and that's because the cities and counties do not collect, for the most part, do not collect gas taxes. They're collected by the federal government, they're collected by the states. Most states share some of their gas taxes with the cities and counties, but cities and counties are forced to come up with $30 billion a year of supplemental revenues, general funds, to help pay for uh, roads and bridges. And this is a bridge in, in my former hometown of Portland, Oregon, that is given a, a score of 2 out of 100 in structural soundness uh, and should be replaced, and yet they don't have the money to replace it. They do have the money to build billions of dollars of light rail lines. So they don't have money to replace the bridge. Uh, by other measures, uh, including the pavement roughness measure, which is an interna international index, highways are also improving. Hi highways are steadily getting uh, smoother and smoother because we have been maintaining them well. But again, 
uh, you can see that the highways that are doing the best are the interstate highways, which are state-owned, whereas the ar arterials that tend to have more locally owned roads are not as smooth, again suggesting that if you're not funding your roads out of user fees, you're likely to be uh, inadequate, have inadequate maintenance. So we have uh, poor maintenance, particularly of local roads, and we have another problem which isn't solved by raising gas taxes, and that is congestion. Congestion costs Americans, according to the Texas Transportation Institute, it costs travelers more than $100 billion a year. That doesn't count the cost to businesses, such as FedEx and UPS that have to own more trucks because it takes longer to deliver each, make each delivery. It doesn't cost, count the cost to emergency services, uh, which take longer to reach uh, uh, fires or uh, health problems or whatever. And so because of these costs, probably the total cost of congestion are around $200 billion a year. And this is a dead weight loss to society. It's not like we say, oh, uh, we've got a, the Pentagon buying hammers for $200. Well, somebody's making out some money from that $200. And yes, the taxpayers are losing, but at least somebody's making something off of it. <coughs> In this case, nobody's getting anything out of congestion except for those anti-automobile environmentalists who uh, experience glee whenever they see other people stuck in traffic. I don't think that's worth $200 billion, so I don't think that's a, a justification for more congestion. It struck me recently that congestion is really two very different problems. And I want to explain this to you carefully so I can show you how uh, replacing the gas tax with a vehicle mile fee will help solve uh, the secondary problem of congestion and will save people hundreds of billions of dollars a year. <clears throat> traffic uh, engineers have looked at how traffic flows and how congestion takes place. And what they find is, is that when at very low rates of traffic, you, people can drive, say, on a freeway at 65, 70 miles an hour, but as the traffic increases, uh, traffic slows down a little bit until you reach what I call the maximum capacity, maximum flow capacity of the road, which is for a freeway typically, typically about 2,000 vehicles an hour. If you try to put more than 2,000 vehicles an hour on that road, on, on a lane of that road, the traffic slows down a lot. And when it slows down, suddenly the capacity also declines. So you notice the capacity here uh, is gone down to, say, 25 miles an hour, only 1,000 vehicles per hour. And so that makes roads the only resource I know where supply decreases when demand increases. You've got roads that theoretically could move 2,000 vehicles an hour, but because for a few minutes they exceeded that level, now the traffic flows at only 1,000 vehicles an hour. Somebody recently posted this video of congestion online. They have cars spaced equidistantly apart, moving around in a circle. But if one car slows down just a little bit, it forces everybody else to slow down, and you get patterns of congestion taking place uh, that you wouldn't expect if everybody could drive perfectly at the same, exactly the same speed. Of course, people don't drive exactly the same speed. And so you get what's called a breakdown in traffic. And those breakdowns lead to enormous congestion. Let me show you how this works by looking at congestion flows over the course of a day. Uh, we have here time of day, and then on the vertical axis, the number of vehicles per hour. Well, early in the morning, there's very few vehicles per hour going, so there's no congestion. And so people are going at 65, 70 miles an hour, whatever is the, the design speed of the highway. And then as you approach the capacity of the road, traffic has to slow down a little bit. And uh, uh, I designate yellow at driving at only 50 miles an hour. Once you reach the capacity of the road, then suddenly uh, <coughs> the traffic breaks down, and you're down to traveling at 20 or 30 miles an hour, and the flow capacity of the road has declined. So even though flows fall below the maximum capacity, 
you're stuck in traffic for hours until finally flows fall below the new limited capacity, and then uh, you get free-flowing traffic again for a while until the afternoon when it all starts over again. And that means you've got hours and hours of traffic, even if only for a few minutes during that time, uh, traffic demand exceeded the maximum flow capacity of the road. Now, economists have long known that we can solve this problem with congestion pricing, with charging more for a road during the most congested periods of the day to shift some of those travelers to another time of day. Uh, Alan Posarski, who's here today, tells me that as much as two-thirds of the traffic on the highway during rush hour is not work-related traffic. So it would be easy for some of those vehicles to shift to a different time of day uh, with, the, with the congestion fee. The problem is, is that people don't like to pay twice. People say, I paid for the roads with my gas tax. Why should I have to pay a congestion toll on top of that? That's discriminatory against poor people. So it's been suggested by the Reason Foundation and others that what we need to do is build new lanes next to existing highways and charge for those lanes build those new lanes with the tolls, charge for those lanes, and then people can take, have a choice of taking the, the free lanes and being stuck in traffic, or taking the tolled lanes and getting there faster. That really doesn't solve the congestion problem. Here we see our flows. If you have hot lanes, the lanes where there's a few lanes that are tolled and the rest of them aren't, you can see for, in this graph, about six hours of the day, you have to charge maximum tolls to be able to keep the, the traffic free-flowing in the, in the tolled lanes when the other lanes are congested. If, however, you tolled all the lanes, you'd only have to toll during the times of the day when the traffic was approaching the maximum flow capacity of the road. In this graph, only about three hours a day of the day instead of six hours of the day. So you'd have to toll during fewer hours. The tolls probably wouldn't have to be as much, and uh, you could essentially double the capacity of all the lanes in the highway during the red periods when, uh, when the capacity goes uh, above that. This is a problem that can't be solved simply by raising gas taxes. And as long as people are going to say, I don't want to pay a gas tax and a toll, it can't be solved that way either. So I propose to get rid of gas taxes completely and replace them completely with mile per mile tolls uh, and uh, those tolls would be fixed on a per mile basis if you're driving on uncongested roads, and they would be variable on congested roads. Now, how would this work? My home state of Oregon did an experiment a few years ago where they put GPS devices in uh, several hundred cars, and the GPS devices kept track of where people went. If they went in certain zones, they paid a certain rate. If they went in other zones, they paid another rate. If they left the state, they paid zero. And then they would go to special gasoline pumps that were designed by the state when the gasoline uh, uh, nozzle was inserted in your car, your car, your GPS would send a signal to the gas pump telling it how much money you owe. It would not tell your car where you went. It would not tell you, your car or the gas pump when you went there. It would only say how much money you owed, and it might be broken down you might owe this much to the city for driving on streets. You might owe this much for the county to, for driving on county roads. And you might owe this much to the state for driving on state highways. And if there's any private roads nearby, like the Dulles Parkway, you might owe that much to them. Uh, this way, there would be no invasion of privacy, because no data are transferred other than the actual amount you owe. Now, the state of Oregon noted that there's a trade-off between privacy and auditability. If your GPS told the state everything about when and where you went everywhere, and then they told you, you owe us $1,000, you could say, no, just look at this. I didn't drive in the places you're saying I'm driving. I only owed you $100 or $5 or whatever. At the other extreme, you could have absolute privacy, but no ability to audit. So if the gas pump says you owe $1,000, tough luck. You don't have any way to challenge that. I propose that your GPS or whatever is in your car that's recording where you're going keeps all the information about when and where you've been there. It transmits the price to the gas pump or whatever is the uh, uh, receiver. 
And if you have an objection to it, if you think that you're being cheated, you can go and, and use the data that's in your GPS to correct that. Once you're satisfied with it, you can push a button and erase those data so that nobody could ever access them again. Now, it doesn't have to be a special GPS for your car. It could be an ordinary transponder like the Fast Track or Easy Pass transponders that are used for toll roads here. Uh, in Oregon, uh, all trucks carry transponders because they use them for the weight mile taxes. Uh, and you could just use a smartphone. Most smartphones now are GPS capable, so you could just use your smartphone and pay for it that way. So there's a lot of ways of working it out but we can do it in a way that preserves privacy. We can do it in a way that allows local governments to collect the funds they need to maintain the roads and, and build new roads. We can do it in a way that allows a relief from congestion. There would be some other side benefits as well. For one thing, people are concerned about urban sprawl, and there's a concern that suburbanites are having their transportation subsidized uh, by urbanites. And the solution to that so far has been for many cities to draw urban growth boundaries around themselves to limit the ability for people to move into the suburbs. In Oregon, for example, it's 98% of the state is zoned rural and you're not allowed to build a house in rural areas unless you own 80 acres, you actually farm it, and you actually earn $80,000 a year farming it. The problem with that is that it creates huge unintended consequences. Oregon housing prices have quadrupled, uh, housing is no longer affordable to a lot of people. Uh, it's created huge problems for businesses as well because land prices have gone way up. Uh, studies have shown that simply using congestion pricing and, and vehicle mile pricing, we could take care of all the problems with urban sprawl, all the, the, uh, the supposed externalities with urban sprawl much more efficiently without all the side costs involved in using urban growth boundaries. <clears throat> Uh, this system would also create a, com a competitive system. Most cities, as I noted, have city streets, county roads, uh, state roads. The, uh, this is a map of Houston. There's all kinds of different roads on there. Houston has several county toll road authorities, which are separate from the county road authorities. The toll road authorities build roads. They pay for the roads exclusively with tolls. They're pretty independent of... Uh, the, the counties themselves, because they're essentially their own entity. They make their own money, they spend their own money, they don't have to get approval from anyone to do it. So they're almost like a private toll road authority. And they've built some, some great roads. This is the Fort Bend Parkway. It costs $10 million a mile to build. That's a four-lane road for $10 million, meaning $2.5 million a lane mile. One lane carries about five times as many people as a typical light rail line that costs $50 million a mile. And some light rail lines are now costing over $200 million a mile. So you can see this is a very efficient way. And you've got, uh, since you have competing road networks here, they have an incentive to be as efficient as they can so they can attract your tolls as opposed to you deciding to go somewhere else because uh, their tolls are too expensive. It's interesting to me that we have some such strong differences in the private sector versus the public sector as far as innovation goes. A few years ago, my Macintosh looked like this on the back, and then I got an upgrade, and you can see all of the ports are different from the two different versions, except for the, uh, the, the speaker port. Every other port is different, and now I have a Macintosh like this, and again, they're all different, uh, and that's because the private sector innovates really fast the new innovations are faster, they're better, they're cheaper, and they give people incentives to, to follow that innovation. By comparison, uh, the, <clears throat> in transportation, 125 years ago, we saw the beginnings of the streetcar system in America. Uh, and today, we're seeing cities all over the country saying, we want to have 21st century technology, let's build some streetcars. Their idea is... The most innovative idea they can think of today is to build a 125-year-old system. Now, I wasn't going to show these slides today, but uh, uh, somebody, uh, Google, invited some people here at Cato to ride in their Google self-driving car uh, yesterday. And we took these pictures yesterday. That's David Bose and I uh, looking at the self-driving car. Uh, the car, uh, this is a monitor they have inside the car. It keeps track of everything around it. 
All these little white squares are pedestrians. The bigger boxes are vehicles. Uh, the, 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 he's pointing to a stoplight that uh, the car is seeing. The car can registers the, the speed limit and so on and so forth. The self-driving car is technologically feasible, and if it doesn't happen soon, it's be going to be because government gets in the way. Uh, I'm really excited that Google is going out on a limb and working on this. I think they think they're going to be able to sell the software because they don't think the auto manufacturers are going to be, have, the, have the daring to, uh, to uh, do self-driving cars. This is an idea that's been around for a long time. I found this 1961 newspaper article from the Chicago Tribune that said, by 1964, we'll have 100 miles of self-driving car highways in this country. And by 1975, all major highways will have self-driving capabilities. Um, that obviously didn't happen, but I think it will happen soon. And with that kind of technological change, uh, we're going to see a lot of differences happening in our uh, uh, highway system and financial system. There's a lot of resistance to raising gas taxes, but if we substitute gas taxes with vehicle mile fees, we can, uh, I think, solve all of these problems cheaply. There are three different actors, three different ways of going about this. One is that Congress could simp simply eliminate the federal gas tax and give states some kind of incentive to shift their gas taxes to VMT fees. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Another is the states could just start shifting themselves. And if they do that, I think they need to work together. And one vehicle for that would be the American Association of State and Highway and Transportation Officials to coordinate so that when I drive my Oregon car into Michigan or the District of Columbia or wherever, that the, the system that's being used in Oregon is compatible with other systems. Doing all that will relieve congestion, solve potholes, make sure that we build more highways when we need them, uh, uh, reduce urban sprawl, and uh, this is uh, Scott Garrett who wants to devolve federal highway transportation funding to the states. This, an, another side effect is devolution. So my paper, I think you should all have copies of it. Uh, I'll be glad to answer questions after the other two speakers. I also, as uh, Michael mentioned, have a book called Gridlock, uh, and I hope there's some copies outside in case you want to take a look at that. Thank you very much.